Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch, and this is Politics Unplugged, and it was an election that brought an end to 24 years in office for Sheriff Joe Arpaio. For two decades, he has been one of the most popular politicians in the, in the state, but just two weeks ago, voters said no more. And Paul Penzone is the candidate that voters chose to replace Sheriff Arpaio, and behind that was uh, a, a strategy, and the person in charge of that strategy is Stacey Pearson from 360 Strategies. Thanks for joining us. And the first question people are going to want to know is, you know, what was different this year than all the other elections that Arpaio won and won pretty handily? We, there were a couple of things. One, in 2012, we made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. We ignored some voters that were frustrated with what was happening in law enforcement and really in politics in general in Maricopa County. Mm -hmm. um, we addressed those problems. And second, um, we had two candidates this time. In mm -hmm. 2012, there were three. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a cleaner race. It was mano y mano, and we, we discuss the issues people wanted to talk about. Now, a lot of people are, uh, you know, uh, are going to also wonder what were the key issues you guys were focusing on. It may not be some of the most obvious stuff that people are thinking. Obviously, a lot of people know all about his legal issues, right. but there may be some other things. There were, there's only so much you can attack an opponent before you start, before you need to start talking about what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And heroin's a huge issue in Maricopa County right now. Mm -hmm. um, it is opiate abuse, pills in junior highs, kids having access to prescription medication, pain pills, addiction, etc. Those were huge issues. Issues. And we talked to voters directly about those about those problems and Paul's plans to crack down on pill mills and address drug addiction and look at substance abuse treatment in jails and reduce recidivism and cut out the stunts. And, and what was the re response to that when you guys started focusing on the heroin um, uh, issue? Because that was a little bit later in the campaign. It wasn't really from the beginning. It was. Um, it's heartbreaking, honestly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the, the phone calls that I was getting or that we were getting, that Paul was getting, the folks that were stopping him have very personal experience with this. Mm -hmm. Their son, their daughter, their nephew, their niece um, has battled uh, opiate addiction, and it, it's tremendously damaging to a family. So it, we, we weren't talking about um, crime rates in general terms. We were talking about an issue that has a very serious impact in all homes. It's not necessarily one mm -hmm. socioeconomic class or one race or one ethnic group or one area. So basically you feel like you like hit an issue that nobody was really talking about. Agreed. You started that conversation and really resonated with voters. We did. Yeah. So I mean, uh, some other issues out there. I mean, how much of this, all things aside, you know, legal problems, you right. know, we, can, we can go into that and do a whole show on that. But uh, how much of this, all things, all things considered, was there any Arpaio fatigue? That There were just supporters of Joe. There were just well, it's time to move on because, I mean, that was a message of one of your campaign yeah. uh, commercials was it's time to move on. We uh, we certainly think that existed. But mm -hmm. if you look at the polling over time, we started polling in November of 2015 um, to see what the chances really were, how, how bad the fatigue really was. And it mm -hmm. was a dead heat. So... Uh, uh, the, I wouldn't, I, it'd be, I think, naive to say that the, all of the damage of Arpaio's legal, legal mm -hmm. troubles happened in the last year that's been going for the last sure. decade. Sure. So. But, but we also know from, you know, the presidential election on down, this really was a change election. People really wanted somebody new, and I was wondering if that was, you know, it was helping uh, the Penzone campaign in this as much as some of the other issues. It had to. Yeah. I mean, it most certainly had <laughs> to. And, and just looking at the numbers, we had to convert a significant number of Republican voters and mm -hmm. we did that I mean there were more votes passed for Paul Penzone a Democrat in Maricopa County than for John McCain yeah so and it's not just about the message it's about connecting with the voters that you want to connect with so who were the people you were targeting here this time um, that really you know led to this victory we had a blind spot in 2012 uh -huh. and it was geographically from I-17 to Grand Avenue mm -hmm. up. Yeah. so Peoria Arrowhead Glendale uh, metro center area, the neighborhood Paul grew up in, mm -hmm. um, Sun City, of course, but but we really that that was an area we we under marketed and assumed, given its left leaning tendencies, mm -hmm. voter registration tendencies, that they were just going to come along for the ride, mm -hmm. and that was a, an absolute mistake that I think we're seeing play out on the national scale mm -hmm. on on in Trump's campaign. Mm -hmm. And then the other area we looked at was the far southeast valley, mm -hmm. your typically Republican conservative family mm -hmm. um, living in Gilbert, Chandler, mm -hmm. Mesa. 
Well, I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you. You know, how much did you know female uh, women voters, moms, play into this? Because I would imagine the heroin message was really kind of geared to them as well. Um, wh what were you seeing there during this campaign? It was. It was our pr a primary target of ours. Um, we spent more time communicating with women and communicating with folks in those two geographic areas than anything else. We knew we had limited resources. We knew we were going to be outspent handily. So the money that we spent was targeting very specific voters, and, and women made all the difference. Yeah, I mean that's, that's another thing. You guys were re really very, very much heavily outspent. Yeah. We'll ask about that in a little bit, but. I also wanted to know, too, I mean, for years, Arpaio's been winning elections with big numbers. Obviously, a lot right. of Democrats were, were crossing over and supporting Arpaio. How are you able to get them back this year? We focused on law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the looking at the polling, knowing what we knowing what we knew coming out of 2012, we went back to the issue of law enforcement mm -hmm. and, and actually solving crime reducing recidivism, jailing people efficiently, getting them out of the criminal circle of life, mm -hmm. so to speak, and then moving on. And so what is that like? I mean, you know, uh, Arpaio, I believe, spent over $10 million uh, in this campaign. Yeah. Closer but, to Closer to 12. 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Closer. That's a lot of money. You know, Paul didn't raise you know, nearly that kind of cash. Spent about 750000 yeah. yeah. Was there a point of, like, did you start seeing a point of diminishing returns from uh, from Arpaio's standpoint? But we hoped. <laughs> That's yeah. certainly what we were hoping. Yeah. Um, and we, we expected, the, you know, the attack ads to come. They came earlier than they did in 2012. We had a response ready for that. I mean, we really went into this election cycle with all the lessons learned from 2012 and acknowledgement of mistakes we made in 2012. And we lost by six points four years ago, and we had to make sure we didn't repeat the same errors. All right. So, so what is the what, what are some of the lessons then from this uh, this election here, at least on the county level? Because n not only is Paul a Democrat, uh, we also saw voters they chose yeah. the first Democrat to be uh, the, the recorder in Maricopa County, and like. 50 years or something like that. Right. Um, is, is this something that is just a one-time thing, or were you seeing anything in the polling data, anything in, in, in anywhere else, that this could be a trend for Maricopa County, which has typically been a, a Republican stronghold for a long time? Yeah, well, I think Arizona is a bellwether period. I mean, strange ideas and interesting trends start in the state. I mean, look at 1070, you look at bathroom bill, you look at all sorts of things, and it's mm -hmm. very true in this election. Look at 2012, you can take no group of people for granted. Mm -hmm. So the Latino vote, there's a portion of them that still vote for Arpaio, that still mm -hmm. voted for Arpaio now. So talking about the Latino vote as if it's a block to be assumed sure. is yours is ignorant. Mm -hmm. um, the same is true with a female vote or mm -hmm. a geographic vote. Mm -hmm. So so what we learned was that there's no there are no guarantees and the Dems that that your working class Dems, your mechanics and your um, Gosh, you know, you're working class Dems, your firefighters, your cops, your the union members, those guys, they're, they're not voting as a block. They're okay. voting on peop for people that they trust, that are addressing their issues, mm -hmm. that care about their longevity, that are worried about opiate abuse when it comes to law enforcement. It's those guys. Yeah, but I mean, people see this election as like, you know, the county, uh, you know, really rock solid red. You know, they see it turning purple a little bit and they're wondering what's the future going to be. I think the future for Maricopa County is going to be issues-based politicking. It's not going to be big block. I mean, you're going to have a Democrat as a sheriff and a county recorder and a Republican as a county attorney, and all of this is going to have to function well together. It's going you're to be a little You're very ecosystem. much an optimist here. It's going to be an issue-based uh, election for moving on forward, aren't you? I hope. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for stopping by. That's all the thanks. time we have uh, for this. We're going to have to take a quick break, but we have lots more to come here on... Politics Unplugged coming up next. Democrats had hoped to gain some new leverage at the state capitol. The Republicans still in charge. We talked to the House Majority Leader about the priorities you can expect to see next session. Yes, maybe it is profiling, but if they're known gang members, I hope we're profiling these known gang members. I hope we are. We should be doing that. That's how you, you, you watch out for crime. You can't wait for a crime to occur and pretend like it never happened and you didn't know who they were. And one Phoenix City Council member says even Donald Trump's plan to deport illegal immigrants convicted of crimes may not be enough. Still ahead, his idea for getting rid of so-called sanctuary cities. Big weather changes on the way. Three TVs got you covered with live reports from across the state and the valley and road conditions to get you to work on time. Stay with Three TV for all your big weather coverage Monday morning starting at 4.30. 
Help us donate 5,000 turkeys to Arizona families this holiday season. For just $10, you can buy a holiday turkey scan card at any Fry's Food Store. Let's make sure every Arizonan has a holiday to remember. From Fry's Food Stores and 3TV. I really did save hundreds of dollars on my car insurance with GEICO. I should take a closer look at GEICO. GEICO has a long history of great savings and great service. Over 75 years. Wait, 75 years? That is great. Speaking of great, check out these hot riffs. You like Smash Mouth? Uh, yeah, I have an early day tomorrow, so... Wait, almost there. Good night, Bruce. I gotta tune the A. Me, 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 me. Take a closer look at GEICO. Great savings and a whole lot more. I'm no marketing guru, but this guy is. He's from Madison Avenue. He likes to say things like, Raised without antibiotics. That's a phrase he invented to make chicken sound safer. And it doesn't mean much because by federal law, all chickens must be clear of antibiotics before they leave the farm. I got more. Mom approved. Caffeine free. We think Mr. Marketing Guru would fit in better at a different chicken company. Oh, I got it. Gluten free. All chicken's gluten free. I don't think that's... Okay, no, it is. Fresh, delicious chicken from Sanderson Farms. Sweetie, you know what we're craving right now? Crispy chicken and fried egg with bacon, like brunch. Brunch? But it's 8 p.m., and it's Tuesday. Huh. I wonder if my mother would like to stay with us. Here's what I'm thinking. Brunch. All day, every day. Should we get started? Who wants coffee? Introducing my new brunch list menu with 10 delicious items like my bacon and egg chicken sandwich, Southwest scrambler plate, a sparkling blood orange cooler, and homestyle potatoes. Served all day, every day, only at Jack in the Box. For all you friends giving hosts, invite who you want, not who you must. Serve a turkey. Don't serve a turkey. Bring classic flaky crescent rolls or not-so-classic pizza sticks. And don't forget something sweet and golden brown, fresh from the oven. Set the table. Set the coffee table. Set no table at all. The only rule to follow on Friendsgiving is make it your own. Happy Friendsgiving. Warm up with Pillsbury. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. And joining us right now is State Representative John Allen, the incoming House Majority Leader. Congratulations on your new position, sir. Thank you very much. And um, I want to just start by talking about uh, what's going to be look looking forward, looking at the legislative agenda for House Republicans last year, obviously dominated really by education. What is going to be the defining issue you see uh, next year? Well, and education will, again, be the the def definition when we look back because yeah. it is the biggest portion of the budget 42 um, percent i think of all states we're going to have yeah. the one two three money mm -hmm. that has to make sure that we that gets spent in the classroom and, and mm -hmm. those sort of things uh what what is very good is we're we're fairly good on outcomes in arizona mm -hmm. in education uh people spend a lot of time looking at the inputs so if we can continue to make improvements on outputs with this extra bit of money that comes in and you know like utah utah is one of the lowest input states and sure. eighth in outputs mm -hmm. you know we want to be an output state. We want people to look at us and say, wow, they get a lot of bang for their buck. We want to support our teachers. We want to make sure kids get out with the best education they possibly well, can. Well, after the passage of Proposition 123, there was a lot of talk about, well, what is 456? What is the second step on this? And I think people watching the show right now are going to be wondering and asking you, what do you see as the second step? And is that going to happen this year? Well, you know, we still have testing uh, mm -hmm. issues to deal with to make sure we get a test that reinforces our education and system, not, not actually in but it's it from being the best it can. So there's going to be a lot of discussion on that. But, you know, if, it, if it's only money, you know, you'll never fix education. What we need to do is we need to strengthen families. We need to strengthen communities. We need to strengthen school boards. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure the school boards are making real decisions, less decisions at the legislature, more in the school boards. Yeah, but a lot of times you do see a correlation between money in the classroom and where they perform on charge. I mean, Arizona clearly... Clearly, Tucson Unified and, yeah. and Phoenix Unified, uh, uh, Phoenix... Tucson Unified and the Phoenix High School thing are, are the worst sure. outcomes in the state, two of the highest paid school districts in the state. Mm -hmm. So y you can correlate money, correlate money to, to outcomes sometimes in, in the exact opposite, which, which you might But mean. I think you look at on the national level, Arizona is amongst the bottom in terms of what it spends per pupil in the classroom, and yeah. it's also in the bottom in performance, so according to many, many people We're out there 25th, who rank these things. 25th in outcomes with the Stanford 10 numbers that come, come out that are in bred, in, embedded into our mm -hmm. uh, standardized tests. Um, is that where we want to be? No. You don't want to be the middle of the pack. You want to be at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell you the truth is we, we have to use monies 
and the correct cur uh, curriculum and good teaching and we need to we need to step up our game everywhere but money is only a component yes. and, and it is the biggest spend we have is there going to be more money put into k-12 this year or next year every year we put more money into K sure and there's inflationary kick in but and I think other things in, yeah. in, in, in addition to that a lot of times there's like we're talking about schools that are crumbling out in the West Valley they want more capital input the capital infrastructure money we're gonna see that well and we have some mechanisms for statewide maintenance of buildings that has not been fully funded mm -hmm. uh, you know we're gonna have to look at that and see where the priorities of, of the the caucus is but yeah we, we, we have problems every state has problems our decline in education which started about 30 years ago has taken place throughout the United States and I think it's been a change in focus of of our uh, educational values <clears throat> get to reinstitute those and get back on track right. so so there is money issues but that is not their biggest issue <laughs> and is there going to be a, a lot of money left over for education at this point what are you guys looking at as far as surpluses I have no idea at this okay. point you know look at we're going to go into a new presidential uh, uh, regime and I'm hoping for great growth I, I, I'm hoping we're just standing in money okay. and so we'll have opportunities to do a lot of great things now let's let's stick with education let's move up a little bit here and so let's talk about the junior colleges here I mean a couple of years ago uh, you know the, uh, the community colleges down in Pima and here in Maricopa County um, got most of their if not all of their state aid taken away from them now these are institutions that people are looking at to train people for those jobs that are not being filled right now do you see more money being put toward that this year well this the coming year the counties do invest in in their, in their mm -hmm. community college they do a great job uh, the state funding was more interfering with them having freedom to make their own choices so uh, although yes we we should go back to some footsie or whatever the the mechanism was to to make sure that they're equal um, you know the counties have been doing a very good job I mean I went to Paradise Valley Community College and you know and then on to SU sure but the state kid all their state aid to the to the big uh, county community colleges yeah well, and it, it, we were in a tough spot, so mm -hmm. I don't know where the caucus is going to be on that. Okay. I really don't. Okay. Now, um, again, Governor... Not having been on any of the education committees in quite a while, so sure, it's one of those things you go, gee, I'd love to know everything the first day on the job, but... <laughs> yeah, sure. So now, Governor Doug Ducey is, was also elected a couple of years ago. I'm sure you were a member on a platform of cutting taxes every year uh, that he was in office. What kind of taxes are we going to look at reducing in this coming session? Well, and, and, and the administration has not quite told me where they're headed I'm, I'm sure that they'll look for ones that target most growth we got to get our economy going I think small business should be our target um, you know we want entrepreneurs uh, you know my wife works downtown uh, we live up near uh, Scottsdale Air Park mm -hmm. the incomes in Scottsdale Air Park are bigger than the ones downtown mm -hmm. those are not entrepreneurial jobs we need small business we need to we need to be building up uh, jobs where people uh, are innovating and creating things and manufacturing and we do that by targeting uh, tax cuts towards small business. Okay, so an, another area here uh, a lot, that's got a lot of interest is obviously is corrections out there. Now, I've been hearing rumors that there could be some potential prison reform coming next year. Um, is that something that you're, you guys will be looking at? Yeah, I'm sure. And, and in my view, our, our, our inability to get people off of drugs has caused us to have repeat offenses that... that cost us way more than would would if we just gave more services mm. but we have to target those correctly and so and no state seems to have found the magic bullet yet to to kind of stop recidivism rates when mm -hmm. it comes down to drug users we have gotta find one we have to do better and also as part of that package would you guys be looking at reducing the sentences for low-level uh, drug offenses well you know lots of times these are, are plea bargains or other mm -hmm. things that there were higher crimes involved and that's where it lands up I don't think that actually would affect the amount of people in prison they would just fall on a different plea bargain at the end so you think that's off the table because usually when you're in for drug offenses you are also charged with other offenses sure and that's the one that they land up being you know convicted of right. and so I'm not sure that's the case we actually need to, to kind of help these people fix themselves all right and another big issue that we've seen now recently that, that has popped up is the Arizona Coyotes say they plan on going to you at the state legislature and, and lawmakers down there and asking them to pony up 200 million dollars to help them build a new sports facility out in Tempe that would be half of the 400 million dollar facility that they want to open for a 2019 2020 session yeah. is this a priority yeah you, you, you'll never catch me on a sports show I, I forgot the Coyotes were still here um, you know they're not a big priority for me personally so I mean it's one of those things where you go 
if they're a lucrative business and they're going to add value to our communities and bring in uh, more money than they cost us, we might have an argument. I don't know if the coyotes are the ones that can actually make that argument. You know, Do you think they should have came to the lawmakers before they made the announcement? It seems like a lot of people down at the Capitol were caught really off guard by that announcement. Did you know about this? No, I didn't. And, and, and to tell you the truth, I, I find subsidies for sports teams a, a little bit difficult when we have kids warehoused in, you know, uh, foster care group homes. Right. So the idea that this would be my top priority is not. It's All right. Not, so. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for stopping by. We'll be talking more in the future. We've got to take another break, but we got lots more to talk about on Politics Unplugged. Still ahead, why one Phoenix councilman says even Donald Trump's plan not uh, <laughs> to get rid of sanctuary cities. Well, I'm saying we ought to take it a step further and start identifying those individuals that are known drug dealers and known individuals that are committing crimes in our community and find out who they are and then get them out of the country. Plus, Mitt Romney and Donald Trump practice some diplomacy. Campaign rhetoric may give way to a political appointment. Next on Politics Unplugged. A baby takes a lot of preparation. And since we have movie nights whenever he falls asleep, we decide to switch to Cox and get Contour TV. We also got high speed internet, so our families can see the baby anytime. Say hi. Cox gave us all this without a contract, just in case we need to plan for more. Already? Get the new Contour with 50 megabits per second internet and phone with free unlimited international calling to Mexico and more. No contract for just $89.99 a month with free pro install. Switch today. Fearless is embracing the possibilities, for this time belongs to you. Make the most of this time with a Medicare plan from a name that's been trusted in Arizona for over 75 years. Medicare open enrollment is now through December 7th. Learn how you can get medical and prescription drug coverage in one affordable Medicare Advantage plan with a $0 monthly premium, $0 co-pays for primary care doctor visits, and no cost to you for preventive care. There are also many wellness benefits, including immunizations and a fitness facility membership that can help you live healthier. Plus, you have the convenience of using one card for all your medical care. Call now to learn more. Open enrollment ends December 7th, so don't wait. You'll find a plan that's right for your needs and lifestyle. If you travel often, you'll love the freedom of our Medicare supplement plans that let you see any doctor who accepts Medicare. And you have a choice of prescription drug plans with a nationwide pharmacy network. Call today. Whether you want an all-in-one Medicare Advantage plan, the flexibility of Medicare supplement insurance, or the savings of a prescription drug plan, we offer a variety of choices for you. And help from Medicare specialists who can match the right plan to your needs. Now is your time to embrace the possibilities. Get the protection of the cross and shield that's been trusted by Arizonans for over 75 years. And live fearless. Call 844-491-5989 to get your free Medicare guide and enrollment kit that simplify your Medicare options. But hurry, open enrollment ends December. December 7th. So call 844-491-5989. That's 844-491-5989 or contact your broker today. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. It's time to talk it out with our partners from First Strategic. And with us today is Marcus Delartino and Barry Dill. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining us. Now, I want to start with this uh, story that seems they've been going on and on and on here. The Coyotes have been searching for this new stadium or new arena deal now uh, for a while. But before the Coyotes can even break ground, they'll have to convince state lawmakers, pony up about half of a $400 million project, uh, that, 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 that they estimate is going to cost to build this stadium that you can see right there. It's actually more than that, though, Dennis. That's true that that would be their the state portion. But don't forget that there's money still owed on the stadium that they're currently played, playing in, which is roughly around $200 million, and I'm being really loose with the numbers. But it's it's more expensive than just that $200. you have got to add another 200 Now, you heard the new House of Minor uh, Majority Leader, John Allen, just talk about this. I asked him about this. He says it's not really much of a priority out there. What was your takeaway well, from that? Well, my takeaway is, is that that's probably absolutely accurate, is, mm -hmm. is there's no stomach to begin with uh, in this legislature or in recent legislatures for 
tax increment financing, you know, yeah. pro programs. Number two is Marcus, I think, has always had it. Marcus is dead spot on about how this whole announcement was, I mean, it was just like a comedy of errors. Mm -hmm. It was a public relations disaster. And so they're already way behind the Lawmakers don't like surprises like this, do they? Uh, they absolutely don't. And frankly, uh, when, they've got, when the priorities are clearly education and health care and growing jobs in the economy, you know, and you've got an existing stadium that is perfectly fine and you can play in, mm -hmm. that you owe money on, asking for more well, money. And, for and look, and I, talk, I was talking to a, a public interest attorney um, uh, the, day, the day after the story broke, and he's like, why do we want to do this again? Because we saw what happened with the Diamondback Stadium. It's a depreciating asset. Well, it cost $350 million 20 years ago, and now if they're saying it's worth $60 million, why should the taxpayers be paying for that? Here's the bigger problem that they have, is, is that the Suns also need a new stadium. Correct. Okay, and you are not going to you are not going to convince this legislature and this governor to help finance two brand new facilities for two two more teams. If they if the Coyotes can get together with the Suns and come up with a, a plan on how to build a joint use facility for the two of them, that may be one thing. But now just going out on their going out on their own is not likely to happen. All right, let's move over to another big issue here. We're talking about sanctuary cities. Um, now, this has been an issue that has been playing out across the country. Now, Phoenix is not a sanctuary city. Um, and these are cities that have policies in which they don't cooperate with feds on immigration policy and whatnot. Phoenix does not count as that. But you saw us teasing here uh, during the break, uh, Senator uh, uh, Councilman Sal DeCicio saying that he believes that you know Donald Trump's plans to deport more people, you know, doesn't go far enough, and that police here should be, you know, profiling and targeting people that they only suspect of being criminals. Well, let's back up a little bit. Sal's comments, Councilman DeCicio's comments, were in response to Mayor Stanton's comments, which were in response to, I believe, the Blasio's comments out of New York. So this is a train wreck of communications uh, mm -hmm. that that took place. Go ahead. You got I was, I was, I was going to say, I mean, do, do, do criminals wear signs on their chest that identify them? I mean, I've talked to folks about what uh, Mr. DeCicio had to say. And they I, said, of course, something like that is going to lead to racial profiling and harassment of people of color. I think everybody's sort of forgetting that, it, you know, there's the U.S. Marshal Service, which is a branch of the federal government, by the way, serves warrants on bad people. Um, who are, you know, whether they're convicted drug dealers or whatever, but have warrants out for them. Undoubtedly, some of those people are also illegal immigrants and they're being shipped out. So I think there's a lot that needs to be flushed out in this discussion about sanctuary cities before everybody loses their mind over this election. Everybody needs to calm down for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's get settled and then we'll start to discuss these issues. All right, let's move on to the, the big national story, uh, you know, right now. Uh, you know, just kind of surprising here. We're talking about. Donald Trump looking at, or at least seriously considering, Mitt Romney for a cabinet post. This after Mitt Romney was probably one of the uh, loudest critics uh, of Trump during the campaign, who basically said that he's, you know, his promises are about as worthless as a degree from Trump University. Don't have a heart attack. But I think this is a brilliant move on behalf of the president of the president elect. Okay, because what it does is it puts the onus now on Mitt Romney to. One, accept and be a part of, you know, a, a, a cabinet to where he has respect and he probably has a bigger worldview than most, or to turn it down mm -hmm. and so that Trump can say, well, hey, I tried to reach out and put all this behind so me. Ten, and, ooh, ooh. And, so, and so Trump can only win by this activity. All and right. Romney's in the hard spot. Now. All right, well, that's all the time we have for this week. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next week. Good night.